All right, so, okay. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Wendy Hessenkamp, who serves as a science director at the Mind and Life Institute. Dr. Hessenkamp is a neuroscientist and a contemplative practitioner. She's interested in understanding how subjective experience is represented in the brain and how the mind and the brain can be transformed through experience and practice to enhance flourishing. Her research examines the neural correlates of meditation with a focus on the shifts between mind wandering and attention. Dr. Hessenkamp is the editor of The Monastery and the Microscope, Conversations with the Dalai Lama on Mind, Mindfulness, and the Nature of Reality, published in 2017 by uh, Yale University Press. She has also contributed to neuroscience curriculum development, teaching and textbook creation for the Emory Tibet Science Initiative, which aims to integrate science into the Tibetan monastic education system in India. Her latest project, is the Mind and Life pod podcast, where she interviews leading experts in contemplative science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wendy Hasenkamp. Silent. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, let me see about sharing the screen here. Can you all see the slides? Yes, okay, great. Um, let me get this situated. Okay, great, so yeah, thank you so much, Anna and James, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, my hope is really just to give a kind of brief overview and tour of uh, contemplative science as a field, and then dig into some of the research. Um, so we'll start with a little bit of kind of history and overview and conceptual underpinnings and then i'll just touch on some of the um the areas of research that are alive today and kind of think about where the field is going um and i guess let's hold uh we'll have some q a and discussion time at the end hopefully um so we'll start with a little bit of the history and kind of background on the field um I, I just always like to begin um, by reminding folks, and I'm guessing looking at your syllabus for this excellent class um, that you're well familiar with these ideas, but um, thinking about how Buddhism has moved into Western culture. So of course the Buddha lived um, in about 600 BC and then Buddhist thought proliferated throughout Asia um, for several millennia, always adapting <clears throat> to whatever you know, culture um, it, was, it was being brought into. But here in the US, um, it's really only been prevalent and present for the last 60 or so years um, for several factors, uh, Westerners going to visit Asia and bringing these ideas back, scholars and philosophers studying these traditions, and then of course, Asians from those cultures and traditions moving here and bringing um, culture and religion here. And then more recently, um, Buddhism has been engaged in this dialogue with science, which is mostly what we'll be talking about today. But just kind of a reminder, and I know you've read some of um, David McMahon's work, which is excellent. So a note that kind of the Buddhism that's often encountered with the science is this somewhat of a hybrid um, modern Buddhism, American Buddhism, in some ways different from the ways it's practiced in, in traditional cultures. <clears throat> so when we think about um, Buddhism and science, this really, the conversation um, really started to take shape in the 1980s. And um, if you had a chance to listen to the podcast with Evan Thompson, you heard about some of the, the beginnings of this. Um, so we can think about these three kind of founders, um, the Dalai Lama, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the um, Chilean philosopher and neuroscientist Francisco Varela, who was very interested in Buddhism and um, understanding consciousness through both scientific and introspective methods. And then Adam Engel, um, the entrepreneur who was really committed to bringing these two together and continuing these conversations. And these three joined, and there were many others involved as well, but these were the three official founders joined what's now um, become the Mind and Life Institute 
uh, where of course I work as a science director and we can talk a lot more about that um, in the Q&A hopefully if you have questions um, about the work of the Institute. Um, but really the beginnings of, of Mind and Life and of the Mind and Life was originally just focused on having these dialogues um, between Buddhist scholars uh, and the Dalai Lama as well as Western scientists and philosophers really to engage on questions about these multiple perspectives on understanding and transforming our minds. Um, so this is a, an early, this became the Mind and Life Dialogues. They were um, usually about five day events, really um, an intimate and kind of deep conversation over a number of days between the Dalai Lama and other Buddhist leaders as, and, um, and scientists and scholars in different domains. Uh, this is a, image of Francisco back in the early days um, showing what was then cutting edge, I guess, um, neuroscience equipment. I think this was some EEG work um, as the modern tools of understanding consciousness. Um, these evolved over the years. This was, they became uh, held in His Holiness's um, living room, basically, in his home in, in Dharamsala in exile. There, I know you've uh, heard from Tupton Jimpa, so, uh, younger Tupton Jimpa there. And um, over time, then really in around 2003, the folks who were deeply involved in this um, decided that, you know, there's a lot of rich um, intersection here and we should bring this out more into the world. And that's when Mind and Life really started to bring things more, um, started doing public talks um, in the United States and, and in Europe, and also began things like the Summer Research Institute, which is a week long, um, conference slash retreat setting um, to help develop younger scholars in this field, started offering grants um, for this work. So really beginning to build a whole field around this. Um, at the same time in the 80s, um, John Kabat-Zinn, who you might be familiar with, started to develop um, his program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And I think you'll be um, looking at that more deeply later on in the semester. Um, so he also was involved in this mind and life community uh, of folks and he was a Buddhist practitioner as well as a um, medical clinician um, and researcher. So he was, he took these Buddhist practices and secularized them um, for Western audiences, um, originally adapted for chronic pain and stress populations. So the, these, um, his program was um, delivered in a medical setting in a, in a group um, eight week structured program. And um, because it was a structured program that made it suitable for research for the first time. So you could have large cohorts of folks who you could be relatively sure were being exposed to similar ideas and trainings, and then you could study um, the outcomes. So this led to the first uh, scientific findings in 1985 around uh, mindfulness meditation. This kind of marks the beginning of mindfulness being, um, beginning to be adapted and accepted into Western kind of medical and academic settings. So um, kind of stepping back and looking at, at the field and the, the discussions at large, there's a lot, it's a very interdisciplinary space, um, contemplative science or contemplative research. And so you have a lot of different disciplines and fields at the table. So folks who are interested in consciousness studies, as well as physics, even the um, Buddhism has a lot to say too about, you know, the nature of reality. Um, of course, philosophy is involved, religious studies, and then more on the science side, um, we have cognitive science, neuroscience, various arms of psychology, clinical applied work. I didn't even add in here, anthropology is also um, very relevant. So you can see a, a lot of different perspectives um, at the table and different goals in some cases of, of why people are engaged in the dialogue. And the way I like to think about it is um, there's these different streams of the way that Buddhism has engaged with or influenced these different fields. And so on the one hand, um, and some of the earlier conversations were really focused on more um, consciousness studies and also physics. So questions about um, the nature of the mind and the nature of reality. And in these kinds of conversations, um, it feels like there's more of just a parallel investigation. Like these disciplines have evolved their own ways of looking at things and their own conclusions. 
and the conversation is more about um, you know, exploring the different traditions, seeing where they line up, where they might disagree, and exchanging information. Um, on the other side, I think of it more really as Buddhism, it's more intersecting in that Buddhism has actually really influenced um, the questions that are being asked in these uh, mind sciences and the methods that are being used um, to study it. So I think there's more of kind of a direct impact um, of, of an engagement with Buddhism. Um, in these fields. And that's mostly where we'll be um, talking about today. I also just uh, always leave a note to myself here to just share that from my perspective, um, the engagement between science and Buddhism is really not about science trying to prove that Buddhism is true. That's sometimes discussed and I'm sure there are, you know, some folks who might take that thread a little bit. But um, from my perspective and, and from where I sit, it's really about a kind of joint engagement in terms of, of trying to understand our minds and how we can um, transform our minds and, and reduce suffering from these different perspectives. So I, I personally haven't um, felt any or, or the folks that I'm usually around, it's, it's not about like trying to use science as some kind of a proof. Um, okay, so we will be uh, focusing generally on this kind of intersection today. And um, central to contemplative science, and uh, Francisco Varela talked a lot about this, um, are two modes of investigation um, from these different perspectives. So on the science side, um, we have what's called third person inquiry. This is generally um, considered to be a, the traditional scientific approach. Um, objective perspective, describing the world in a non-biased way. And I, I always put objective in quotes because, um, you know, as researchers, <laughs> we bring our own subjective perspective. Um, so you can never really quite have a truly objective uh, investigation. But we try in science <clears throat> to be as non-biased as possible and not have our own views influence things. Um, and then from the, you know, contemplative side, we have a first person inquiry. Um, this is the subjective view, focusing on one's own experience. And of course, Buddhism and contemplative traditions have really developed these kinds of methodologies um, quite in a quite detailed way. And so a key you know, effort and question is how to bring these two together. How we, can we merge third person and first person inquiry? Um, and I think that question is still very much alive. It's not always clear how that happens, but when you're trying to investigate the mind, um, it's clear that both of these are extremely relevant <clears throat> perspectives. Um, in thinking about the science of meditation, I also tend to group the science into two large buckets. Um, one approach is more of a basic science approach, which is really about understanding what are the mechanisms of how meditation might be working? Physiological, psychological mechanisms. Uh, what does it even mean that it's quote unquote working? Um, so thinking about from the brain side, how our brain networks changing, um, repeated activation of certain networks, how our bodily systems affected. You could also say in here, how our psychological constructs affected like attention, things like working memory, all of those constructs um, falling into the basic science approach. And then you, on the other hand, you have a, a clinical or applied approach, which is really more about um, how can we use these practices to help people, to promote well-being and health. Um, so which populations are going to be um, helped the most? Um, what practices are best used? What are the quote unquote active ingredients? I'm not sure whether you've come across that term, but that's um, Sometimes what's used to describe when we look at an intervention like mindfulness-based stress reduction, for example, there's lots of factors that can be having an impact like the social support of the group setting or being exposed to a great teacher. Um, and then of course, there's also the meditation practices. So um, the emphasis on trying to parse out what's actually having the effect. And then of course, how do the changes that we see at um, the, the physiological and psychological levels, how do these relate to clinical or daily life benefits for people? So I think that, um, you know, some researchers do merge and, and 
um, do work in both of these areas, but usually they'll have kind of one, one or the other of more of an emphasis. Um, again, the basic science really being about how and the applied clinical being about putting it into the world to help people. Um, this is just to share, uh, there's a, quite a number now of secularized um, programs that are being applied uh, in lots of different sectors and that are starting to be studied, um, some more than others. MBSR has been around the longest. It's certainly been the most well studied. Um, MBCT has also had quite a lot of research on it, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, very um, much research on around depression and a lot of efficacy there. And um, these more compassion-based trainings are newer, um, cognitive-based compassion training out of Emory, uh, where you are at Stanford. I'm sure you're familiar with Jimpa's um, cultivation, uh, compassion cultivation training. And um, John McCransky has developed a training out of BC. And then Tanya Singer in Germany has um, developed a nine-month, actually, intervention called the resource training, which there's quite a lot of re research on. So just to let you know kind of where these things are going from the, the research training um, perspective. And um, along with all of this, it's clear that there's, you've probably seen a graph like this before, um, the research just continues to rise really since the early aughts, there's been a almost exponential increase in the number of papers being published um, in the scientific literature around meditation. The blue one is just meditation. Um, and then I think the red is, yeah, meditation and brain. That's less important for this talk, but. Um, and, and so this appears to just be continuing and to go on the upward trajectory. And along with all that research, of course, there's been an enormous rise in popular interest and media interest um, in meditation and mindfulness in particular. Um, so I'm sure you've seen tons of <laughs> coverage in whatever media outlets you might consume. Um, lots of these snazzy infographics that are making pretty bold claims, often based on the results of one small study. Um, so a little bit, uh, actually quite a lot, often of overreach here, a lot of interest in um, changing of the brain, a lot of Time Magazine covers over the years with blonde white women meditating. Um, Google, of course, developing its own program and making pretty strong claims about sustainable happiness coming from just focusing on your breath. Uh, folks like Ariana Huffington making these claims that all these great things um, coming out of mindfulness. So it sounds like a, a label from snake oil from the 19th century, but this cure is real with no toxic side effects, um, which is not necessarily the case as we can talk about more maybe in the Q&A. And I just saw this one recently, which made me laugh. It was a blog with the, the latest time cover on this um, saying, oh, well now women with, time shows us that women with brown hair can also <laughs> practice meditation. So it's just been really interesting to see um, how the media has taken up these topics. Um, and so there's been actually quite a lot of scientific pushback around this uh, media hype. So this was a paper that came out a couple years ago. This was a group um, funded by Mind and Life. A lot of leaders in the field came together to write up kind of a white paper, um, pushing back against the way that this was being characterized in the media and highlighting um, you know, some of the challenges in the field and where we are as, you know, from a scientific perspective difficulties even defining um, the construct of mindfulness, a lot of methodological issues um, that are at play. And so if you're interested, um, this is a great paper that covers kind of issues around assessment, training, um, raises the possibility of, of adverse effects and talks a lot about the intersection with brain imaging. So, um, I would say in the last five years, there's been a lot more emphasis <clears throat> in the field on um, when looking at, you know, the efficacy of these practices on really developing rigorous designs in, in the studies, which involves um, using active control groups. Uh, that's when you design a comparison group to your intervention um, that's controlling for a lot of these nonspecific effects like group cohesion, so a group would meet um, on a similar frequency, 
ideally with the same teacher, but just not teaching exactly the meditation, but something that is supposed to help people. There's a lot of kind of potential placebo and expectation effect in there. So that's the, the role of active control groups, which have been really, um, really helpful, I think, for the field. Also more and more emphasis on randomization. So people can't just self-select into the meditation group because if they're already motivated to do that, that's probably also gonna have an effect. And looking at longitudinal um, outcomes. So over time, not just right after you do the intervention, but how does this last over time or does it? A lot more emphasis on trying to start to understand contextual effects. So what's the impact of kind of the, the social environment, cultural environment on all of these outcomes? These are clearly gonna have um, impact. Really, um, there's been, this is still a quite a young field, so there's been very little replication um, of any of the findings. So uh, I think that really needs to happen a lot more. And then I also just always like to throw in the question, um, it's, it's kind of a perennial question, but are we really measuring and are we able to measure um, the right or most relevant outcomes of practice? I think if you ask people um, why they practice, they'll tell you things like, um, you know, I get more, I get a clearer insight, I have a clarity about my mind states, maybe I'm a, better able to relate to my, those around me, um, so relationship effects. So these often aren't the things um, that are measured, that are easily measured uh, in the field. So I think this is just a good question to, for the whole, for the field to keep holding. And there have been a lot of uh, critiques, of course, of the mindfulness movement, some of which I imagine you've encountered um, already in this class, but a lot of discussion around um, ethics. And since the programs that have been applied in the West are mostly secularized, that means they've been kind of stripped out of the cultural um, traditions in which they were developed. And um, so a question about whether or not that means that the ethical frameworks there in those traditions are removed as well. And is, are there um, dangerous outcomes from that? Um, mindfulness is being applied in military settings and that um, has sparked a debate around what, what's the impact of that? Um, are you just training better killers, for example? Um, or are you giving soldiers um, more capacity for resilience and discernment and things like that that are needed in the course of their work? Uh, McMindfulness, you may have heard of this term. Um, this is kind of the intersection of meditation into a capitalist system um, and the commodification that can happen and has happened around um, the, mindful, the rise of the mindfulness movement. So you can see tons of this online. Um, this is just an example of spending a ton of money and being the best dressed monk for these fancy uh, monastic-like clothes. There's another piece if you want to make a killing on Wall Street, start meditating. So just there's lots of examples of how this um, feeds in with capitalist structures. There's also critiques around um, contemplative spaces being the opium of the elite. And so really just for privilege, really taken up and mostly used in privileged communities. Um, there was an interesting critique, a book called The Mindful Elite that came out last year or the year before just kind of a sociological critique on that. Um, and then also looking at corporate, uh, the way that mindfulness has been used in corporate settings and arguments about whether that is just allowing, um, you know, underpaid or overstressed workers to become more comfortable with their stress <laughs> that's coming from their uh, unhealthy work environment. So lots of interesting um, debates and, and issues have come up around this. Maybe we can talk about some of that in the Q&A. So I'll move on to um, the science side and just kind of give you a quick tour of some of the concepts. Um, I'll say a bit more on the, the neuro side since um, that's my background. Uh, I think that the concept of neuroplasticity is really central to how the field has um, thought about what meditation is doing. And so you may have heard this term, it's um, neuroplasticity is simply the brain's ability to change its structure and function based on experience. And it does this by expanding or strengthening circuits that are used frequently 
and then weakening those that aren't used so often. And um, you may have heard the term like neurons that fire together wire together. That's meaning the, the kind of building of these circuits. When you repeatedly do things, it gets stronger. And we now know that this um, happens throughout the lifespan. It used to be thought um, maybe 20 years ago or so that after adolescence, um, once you, you know, get through your mid-20s, your brain is pretty much wired up the way it is going to be for the rest of your life. And there's not a lot of change that's happening. So um, it's been interesting as we've learned that that's now completely not the case um, and neuroplasticity continues to occur throughout the entire lifespan. It's a little bit harder as you get older. <laughs> so uh, it, is, it is harder to teach an old dog new tricks, but it's completely possible. So I think it's opened a lot of um, possibilities for transformation that we didn't even think about or, or try um, before in these last couple of decades. Um, and I just want to sh mention that uh, I think there sometimes tends to be this uh, way of phrasing it like, oh, meditation kind of taps into this neuroplasticity or like activates neuroplasticity in the brain. But in fact, neuroplasticity is happening all the time. It's just basically the way that neurons and brains work. They're always rewiring based on the inputs and, and what you're experiencing. So it's inherent into, in a brain to be rewiring itself and changing. So you can't use a brain without changing it. Um, and I think the key around meditation and contemplative practice is becoming aware of how you're using it and, and how it is that you are um, shaping it and hopefully having a hand and having some intentional um, focus in shaping it the way you want rather than just being passively uh, consume, you know, whatever the <laughs> culture and media is, is feeding into it. Um, of course, in science, uh, it's important to have definitions and that's something that is not always clear around meditation. So in the popular culture, there's a really wide range of conceptions of what meditation is. If you ask people, um, you'll get ranging states of concentration, relaxation, um, dissociated or trance states. Uh, mystical states in which are religious or you're engaging with higher realities. So all of these are kind of in the mix about what people think of for meditation. So in science, of course, it's important to be much clearer. And this is just an example. This is one of the first uh, attempts to have a concrete definition of what we're talking about. This was in 1986. Um, the process of attentional restructuring, wherein the mind can be trained both in concentration, the ability to rest undisturbed on a single object, and in mindfulness, the ability to observe its own moment-to-moment -moment nature, to pay attention undistractedly to a series of changing objects. So that just gives you a flavor of um, kind of how like concrete <laughs> uh, we try to be in the scientific world. And there's no one answer. There's no one definition, of course. There's so many different practices, um, but it is just important to to be clear about what it is you're studying. So I'll just share this one uh, rubric um, that's been put forward for kind of categorizing different practices for study. Um, John Dunn was actually involved in this work as well as future iterations of this work. Um, so focused attention is kind of a big category of practices um, where you're kind of voluntarily focusing your attention on a single object, could be a visual object, could be often the sensations of breathing um, or some bodily sensation. So kind of a very narrow focus um, on, a, on a single point. And you can contrast that to an open monitoring style of practice, which is much more broad, just taking in the entire content of your experience um, and, and increasing awareness. So that's a, a much broader attentional lens, you could say. And then there's um, compassion and loving kindness practices, which are often using our capacities to analyze and visualize and to generate specific emotions, um, trying to increase compassion and empathy for oneself and others, uh, which is a really different flavor of, of practice. So often um, these styles of practice are combined, um, certainly within the lifetime of a practitioner, but often even within one session. So you can imagine then how complicated it gets to study um, people who are just practicing in their daily life. 
So again, often needing to kind of parse out these particular practices. And um, there have been revisions to the, this um, and, and other kinds of models have been proposed um, for definitions, but this so far is still is used probably uh, the most in the field. So I will just stick with this one for now. Um, so I'll move into a bit of work that, that I did some time ago, looking at attention and mind wandering and the, the fluctuations between them. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with contemplative practice, but um, if you have done uh, any kind of meditation, you'll probably be very aware of the way that mindfulness, uh, I'm sorry, the way that mind wandering tends to pop in when you're trying to focus on anything. So there's been a lot of interest <clears throat> in the last, I'd say five or 10 years in um, mind wandering in the brain and in the psychological literature. And this really emerged from uh, a surprise that came out of the way that brain imaging studies were done originally. So back in the day, um, oh. ooh, sorry, brain imaging studies were uh, done using what's called a block design. So you always have to contrast things in brain imaging. You can't just get a raw signal. So if you're gonna do a task in the scanner, like a memory task or an object selection task or something, um, they would do a block of, of that task and then they would intersperse these rest periods <clears throat> where you would basically just do nothing and look at a, a plus sign on the screen. And then you would you know, subtract, it's, it's a subtractive method of figuring out what's more active in what state. So over time, uh, folks began to realize and looking in those rest periods that there was a really consistent set of brain regions that was more active during the rest periods when you quote unquote weren't, weren't doing anything. But of course, uh, I'm sure you can imagine there's plenty going on uh, subjectively and mentally when you're not doing anything. So there's this consistent set of brain regions came to be called the default mode network. Um, and that's because it seemed to be what your brain did by default when it wasn't actively doing anything else. So no need to worry about the names of these regions, um, but just it was just realized that no matter across populations, it didn't matter the task, whenever people um, weren't actively engaged in doing something, brains tended to look like this. So then of course people wondered, What's, what's this brain network doing? And uh, we knew already from other studies that these areas and networks of the brain were involved in things like remembering things that had happened to you, imagining um, scenarios that weren't happening at the moment, planning, imagining others' thoughts and feelings. So um, this all you know, can be lumped into a bucket called mind wandering. And of course, when you ask people what what in fact they were doing mentally when they were in those rest periods, they would report these kinds of experiences. Um, so this started to associate the default mode network with, with mind wandering. And I think it's interesting to reflect on why would the brain do this um, by default when there's nothing else going on. Um, it's pretty energetically expensive to run a brain so uh, it must be valuable for something. Um, sometimes the, the default men network is called like a time traveling network uh, or mental time travel. So it is really valuable if you think about it um, from an evolutionary perspective to be able to project out of the present moment. Um, so you can imagine something that's not happening to you right now and you can kind of play out scenarios. You can incorporate things from memory the past that have happened to you and use that to try to figure out what might be the best way forward so there's tons and tons of value in being able to do this um, kind of in the background but of course it can also be really stressful and unproductive at times um, leading to things like worry and anxiety and rumination so um, as this research was evolving um, and we were learning more about these networks another factor started to come in where I think, you know, we see these pictures of brain activity and it, these static images and it gives you the impression that like, oh, this area is active or it's not. Um, but that's not at all the case. It comes out of an averaging system. So uh, in fact, if you look at brain activity over time, moment to moment, this is a five minute block of these two regions. You can see both that the brain activity is constantly oscillating and in the case of these two regions, 
they're oscillating in synchrony, they're, they're hanging together. And that's called um, functional connectivity in the brain. And it's thought to mean that these areas are working together to kind of process the same information. Um, so they may not be directly anatomically connected, but they're functioning in the same way. And we see that now there's been tons more research looking at these at networks and how they hang together like this. So still back in the early days, um, people were parsing this out and this orange and yellow is what I just showed on the last slide. So that's the default mode network kind of oscillating together. And then people realized that there were these other set of brain regions that's tended to oscillate uh, in opposition. So kind of when the default mode network was up, this one was down and vice versa. So uh, people knew about these regions that they were really involved in various kinds of attention, um, present moment type focused attention. So things like target detection, making decisions, classifying objects, all of these um, attentional functions were associated with these brain regions. So this came to start to be called um, a large scale attention network. And all these networks have been parsed out and much more um, refined since then. But for these purposes, we can still just think about these broad networks. So at the time, um, people started to wonder, oh, well, are there these two modes of brain function? And again, this is oversimplified now. Uh, we know a lot more, but it works for these purposes. Um, you know, here we have the default mode and the attention network. They seem to be kind of going back and forth and they seem to kind of be doing opposite things in that the default network is involved in these internal mentation thought processes. And the attention network is usually more engaged with what's happening in the world and the sensory systems um, in the external focus. So they're going back and forth like this. So this was all um, happening when I came into this work. And so I was um, inspired by this and thinking about meditation. I was wondering how activity within these networks relates to our own subjective experience in real time. Um, and that came out of um, my own experience with a, a focused attention meditation. Um, so if you've done this, hopefully this cycle will make sense to you. Uh, but you start with a focus, say, for example, on um, the sensations of breathing. And uh, at some point, your mind will almost inevitably wander off and start thinking about any, anything, thinking about dinner, planning your day, replaying something that happened to you, um, any of these mind wandering type events. And then hopefully at some point later, you will realize and have this very kind of salient moment of like, oh, my mind was wandering, I'm supposed to be focusing on the breath. At which point do you disengage um, from whatever the mind wandering content was and re-engage with the object of focus. And really a session of meditation is just a continued cycle of this, um, you know, going on and off of the object. So um, as a neuroscientist, I was interested in what was going on um, in the brain during this time because at the time, in the beginning of this field, people were um, basically just putting people in the scanner and asking them to meditate for like 10 minutes and averaging across those 10 minutes and saying that's what the brain looked like in meditation. And for me, having you know done these practices, there's a lot going on <laughs> in your mind in 10 minutes. So I wanted to try to parse this out a little more clearly. And when I started learning about these networks, I wondered, well, maybe the mind wandering phases as the default mode network coming on and maybe these other um, systems of becoming aware and being able to orient your attention are more of the attention network coming on. So I'll spare you all the methodological details. Um, basically, I had folks who were familiar with this kind of meditation. I put them in the scanner, asked them to, um, and they, they all got what I was talking about with this cycle. It was familiar to them and I just had them press a button when they had this moment of awareness of mind wandering because that's a pretty um, concrete moment. Everyone agreed that they knew what I was talking about and that was a way um, I was inspired by this idea of bringing in the first person with the third person. Um, so this is a just a simple button press is a, is a very rudimentary form of a first person report from having the participant tell me the researcher this is what's happening in my mind right now and then using that to kind of parse out the data in time around that. So I looked a few seconds before, a few seconds after, and looked at the brain networks. 
And so I did uh, see, we saw the elements of the default mode um, right before those button presses and the mind wandering. And during, um, you know, I won't go into all the sub networks, but uh, different aspects of the attention network during these other three phases um, of, of attentional processing in meditation. So that was an interesting, um, you know, exploration of trying to bring in the first person and also trying to highlight the fact that there's a lot of dynamic shifting that's happening in the mind and in the brain um, during meditation and that you can't just say it's all one, one state. Um, and so thinking about with practice and what might be happening, um, these networks, it may not be surprising since you're utilizing them um, at different times in these practices, it turns out that a lot of the research um, from the neuroscience perspective has found changes within these uh, networks. So um, to summarize over a lot of studies, there's evidence of reduced um, default mode network in some cases activation. There's evidence of increased um, activation within attention networks. And I think even more interestingly and importantly, there seems to be an increase in that functional connectivity that I mentioned, the way that these networks are talking to each other. They seem to be a little bit more active in sync, um, such that they might be kind of processing information together, which has been hypothesized to um, potentially be part of what's happening with our ability to regulate ourselves, regulate, become aware of our internal mental states and potentially change them. So um, I'll move on to another um, topic around empathy and compassion. Uh, and I am going to pick up the pace a little bit because I'm aware that we're a little bit short on time. So uh, I'll skip this slide, just looking at um, the neuroscience. Of, this was some of the earliest work um, from Tanya Singer on understanding empathy in the brain. Um, so she was able to identify a certain brain network that seemed to be active both when someone was experiencing pain and experiencing the pain of a loved one that she began to call the empathy network. So that was um, back in the early aughts. And what I think is interesting here is, um, again, through the Mind and Life community and dialogues, she began working with uh, Mathieu Ricard, some of you may be familiar with, um, Tibetan monastic who also was a, a scientist um, prior to becoming a monk. So he's been involved in a lot of the early scientific studies. So he and Tanya were working together and she asked him to come in um, to kind of do some pilot work. And she thought, oh, well, I've identified this network around empathy and Mathieu was known for being uh, really an expert in compassion practices. And she thought, oh, well, his, you know, empathy network would be like on steroids. So he'd be a great person to study. Um, so she brought him in and had him do these uh, compassion practices in the scanner. And um, she was expecting to see, you know, a lot of activation in, in this empathy network that she had described. But instead, she saw a completely different network, which was related, um, the, the regions were related to reward processing and kind of positive affect and um, love and affiliation, things like this. So she was very confused and, you know, pulls him out of the scanner and says, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about like, some rewarding thing like delicious lunch or something, you're supposed to be thinking about the pain of others. And he said, oh, I was, you know, I was uh, experiencing the pain of others and suffering and then and wishing them to be free and like generating these warm feelings, um, motivation to help relieve their suffering. And she said, oh, well, don't do that. Just feel the pain of the other people. So he kind of was like, all right, and went back in the scanner and indeed that network then showed up um, this empathy for pain network. And so she pulled him out and said, okay, great. You know, we got what we needed. And he said, no, no, like, please let me go back in and do the compassion and like motivation to relieve suffering. Cause I feel terrible. Like, why would anyone just want to sit with pain of others and not be able to do anything about it? So through their ongoing conversations, um, this was really, uh, I think a shift in the, from the psychology perspective, understanding the difference between empathy and compassion of just resonating with the pain of another person versus um, developing this motivation and these warm feelings um, to help and to relieve the suffering. So um, this, I think I'm going to skip the details of her research, but basically she went on to 
study this and parse out in the brain um, whether people, you know, she trained people in empathy and then saw um, an increase in negative affect and then also within this empathy network and then trained them in compassion and saw um, in response to experience of suffering of others, increases in compassion and the, and the um, affiliation network. So she started to parse this out um, in research. But really, I think the, the take home here is that it's, it's developed this shift um, in our understanding of these two processes um, of empathy and compassion. Whereas in empathy, it's really about perceiving suffering in the world and then you feel that the same, you feel that same suffering. Um, with compassion, you perceive the suffering and then you feel the motivation um, to relieve that suffering. So there's a difference in the training and the experience. And the idea that's come to pass in, um, in a lot of uh, applied settings is that if you just have empathy, it can really lead to burnout. Um, and this is experienced in a lot of um, caregiving professions and things like that. Uh, whereas it's possible that with training and compassion that might help bolster and lead to resilience and avoid this kind of a burnout process. So really distinguishing different, different outcomes, different brain networks um, related to these. And so now, of course, we showed the, the compassion, lots of different compassion training programs that have been developed and now starting to be used and studied in a lot of different um, sectors where, you know, caregiving and um, people are engaging frequently with the suffering of others. So this is a, an interesting, I think, um, direction uh, and newer, newer part of the field. The early years of the field were really almost solely focused on mindfulness. And so compassion is now starting to come in, um, in more. So I'll just run through a few of the um, trends, um, current trends in the field at large. Um, so as I just said, mindfulness has been studied the most uh, in this field for the longest time. So now we're at the point with those interventions where we can start to do pretty serious meta-analyses. And that's when you look across a whole bunch of different studies, you lump them together, and then you have more statistical power to see, like, is there really an effect that's consistent here? Um, and so this was a, a meta-analysis that came out in 2014 showing um, positive benefit from mindfulness interventions for depression. Um, so now also it's been found that um, MBCT, the mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy is equally effective as um, antidepressants for a lot of people, uh, also helpful in preventing depression relapse. Um, also some uh, success in pain and chronic pain uh, interestingly, not necessarily reducing the pain itself, but really quite helpful in how people relate to and manage and um, kind of process that pain. Lots of application in addictive um, smoking and addiction areas, um, benefit there and um, reduction in anxiety and increase in um, body awareness. So that was 2014. Um, fast forward four more years. In 2018, there was another pretty big meta-analysis. And this is even starting to parse out now. Um, more and more rigorous studies were being done, as I mentioned, the use of active controls, for example. Um, so control groups that are really designed to um, almost replicate all the aspects of the intervention except the meditation. So this study found, um, or this meta-analysis found uh, mindfulness therapies being superior to a number of these different active controls, even again with an emphasis on depression, uh, pain, and addictive um, addictive disorders. So there is actually um, some pretty solid evidence now in those in those domains for effectiveness of of mindfulness. Um, this is a, a different angle, but I think a really interesting. Um, I was originally kind of trained as a cellular neuroscientist, so I always love when you get down to the level of cells. Um, and there's some work on telomeres. Um, so telomeres are these DNA repeats at the end of a chromosome. And um, they degrade over our lifetime as you age. And the degradation and the shortening of these uh, repeats is associated with a lot of negative health outcomes, um, lots of diseases and early mortality, things like that. So um, there have been a number of studies, a handful, 
looking at meditation and the effects on telomeres. And they have been associated with longer telomeres. So we have this enzyme that comes along and kind of rebuilds uh, those repeats. And so it's always a balance between the shortening and the rebuilding. So it looks like meditation is associated with longer telomeres and increased activity of that enzyme that helps with the rebuilding. So this work is ongoing, but I think it's kind of an interesting direction to look at this really cellular DNA level. And the last thing I want to talk about is um, around implicit bias. And of course, you know, we're in a moment uh, in this country really looking deeply at uh, structural racism, um, systemic racism, and implicit bias is something that has uh, come up a lot um, recently. So I imagine you're all pretty familiar with what this is, but um, these are the biases and uh, associations that we are kind of always just absorbing. Um, they're propagated, reinforced by society, media, culture, power structures, all the associations that are kind of just fed into us all the time. Um, that we are always unconsciously internalizing. And so since we are, we're forming links in our brains, in our minds, um, linking these associations. Uh, again, kind of neurons that fire together, wire together, even if you're not aware of it. So these then leads to these implicit um, associations or beliefs that we all hold that can disagree uh, with what we consciously think. And of course, this is um, what leads to stereotypes um, around all sorts of different groups, in this case, um, races. So there's been a lot of interest in um, whether and how meditation might impact this process or can it change implicit bias. Um, the original work was done around loving kindness practice. Uh, and this is a great study done by Yuna Kong in 2014. And so loving kindness is, you know, again, this um, practice of wishing well, often you start with yourself and then you move outward and outward towards um, a larger and larger circle of others. So the idea being that, oh, maybe you're expanding, you know, the sense of care for others and maybe this might change the way that you, you know, you inherently naturally view other people. So she developed a six week uh, loving kindness intervention and she had a great active control, which was a discussion group. Um, so the people met on the same frequency and with the same teacher, different participants, but the same teacher and the discussion group just talked about loving kindness. They didn't actually do the meditation practices. So I love that control, same content, but not really doing the work and then a weightless control. And so it turned out that um, those who practiced the loving kindness meditation did show reduced implicit bias for two stigmatized groups, um, blacks and homeless people. Whereas the discussion group, the folks who just talked about it, um, didn't have this reduced implicit bias. So that was, uh, I think, really interesting. Perhaps not surprising, but you have to do the practice <laughs> to, change, to change your mind. So that was, um, that was a really interesting beginning. And uh, another study shortly thereafter looked at just a really brief induction, seven minutes of loving kindness. That was specifically towards a photo of a black person um, versus a neutral photo. Um, and then that, that intervention or quick induction lowered implicit bias um, specifically towards black faces. So again, suggesting that maybe doing these practices can change um, the way we just unconsciously have these associations. <clears throat> there has been um, continued work actually even in the mindfulness, so not, not necessarily loving kindness practice, but just mindfulness practice. Um, also showing reductions in implicit bias. I'm not going to walk through the details here, but I'll leave the slide um, for your reference in case you're interested. Um, but various kinds of mindfulness work showing reductions. And I just want to fast forward to the, the most recent um, study on this, which is great because it's a longitudinal study. So all the work that had been done until this one um, last year had just looked at implicit bias like right after, um, right after the intervention. And so the you know one question is does does this last at all? And so um, this study was a nine week um, intervention combining mindfulness and loving kindness, and this was for pre service teachers, so folks who were going to become teachers but they weren't yet uh, working in the classroom. And of course, implicit bias is a, a huge um, issue in in classrooms, um, and could be potentially contributing to the racial disparities in education outcomes. So this is a really interesting population to look at. Um, 
So they did this intervention versus a control group of just kind of regular teacher education. <clears throat> and they found that the mindfulness group um, had lower implicit bias um, on race for children. Photo, this is um, tested through looking at photos um, and based on reaction time. So for children and adults. And that effect um, continued six months later with no further training. So that was encouraging. Um, and of course, the, the next step in all this work is whether these uh, measures of implicit bias correlate with behavior in the real world, right? So that's what really matters. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about these, uh, the way we might be able to shift our unconscious um, associations um, and the way that we are forming, forming those links in our minds. So the last thing <clears throat> that I'll mention around that is this study that I think is uh, super cool just looking at a very basic um, form of this is so well validated in in neuroscience research um, classical conditioning so again neurons that fire together wire together this is like Pavlov's dog where you pair the meat and the bell uh, over time and then you know after a while the dog will salivate just for the bell right so it's again this basic linking forming of associations so um, this studied whether mindfulness um, it impacts that or changes that. And it used a really um, simple way to study this in humans called eye blink conditioning. So you wear this fancy little contraption and you hear a tone in your ears and you get a puff of air in your eye, uh, which is kind of unpleasant. Um, so you, you learn to blink your eye, um, you associate that tone with the puff. And so they did a mindfulness um, intervention, a three week intervention and then they did the conditioning, checked the conditioning. And they found basically that um, the mindfulness group had uh, evidence of, of less conditioning. So like um, they had more trials until the first response and fewer conditioned responses overall. So the idea that mindfulness might act to reduce um, the way we automatically make those associations uh, so each like each experience is almost more in the freshness of the present moment. You're not bringing the baggage, the filtering um, from the past. So I thought this was a really interesting, this is just a brief report, a small study, but um, it's the first time I've ever seen it looked at at this very um, basic level of, of neuroscience and unconscious conditioning. So that's cool. Um, all right, yeah, looking ahead, um, just at the field in general, I think one of the exciting directions is that most of the work, um, almost all the work that's been done so far has been looking at outcomes for the individual who is practicing. And that of course makes sense, right? You do meditation practice to change your own mind. But I think there's a lot of um, interest and potential for now examining how it might change interpersonal interactions and even more complex at a societal level. So moving kind of outward um, to think about larger impacts than just like one's own brain or daily life experiences. And I'll just end with um, a nod to, you know, particularly thinking about systemic racism, but all these um, societal issues or things that we might want to change. When we talk about contemplative practice, we're really mostly talking about changing one's own mind. But then, of course, there's all the work that is happening and needs to happen at you know, kind of structural levels, societal policy levels also. So it's kind of this um, dynamic back and forth, I think, between what we can change as individuals and the work that has to happen at larger levels. So um, thank you so much for your kind attention. I will leave it there and uh, we can have some time for discussion. <laughs>